as I mentioned, that we will be talking to another guest who is live or about to be live from uh, Texas football practice, a fellow Bobcat alum, so therefore one of the top 1% in this oh world. <laughs> 247's <laughs> very own Jeff Howe. Jeff, how are you doing, man? Best introduction I've ever had from <laughs> you in my life. Let's go, baby. All right, Jeff, I'm going to start you off right away. We're going to get right into it. Uh, is Steve Sarkeesian going to name a starting quarterback, yes or no, before week one? Oh, I thought you were going to ask today. Um, no, <laughs> Not today. Yeah, no. I, think he, I think he will. And kind of here's where my gut is on, on the quarterback situation. I think if he names it shortly after the first scrimmage, it's going to be Quinn Ewers. Like, I, I just think that there's enough within this offense. Yeah, they've got some offensive line issues, and I'm sure we'll touch on that. But I think when you look at how deep and talented they are at running back, the weapons they've got at wide receiver, uh, a, 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 a small yet really talented group of tight ends, I think there's enough to insulate the quarterback to where you don't really worry about Quinn Ewers and experience. You just feel like the arm talent is so good mm -hmm. that with a couple of these young receivers, with a couple of these young offensive linemen, if he can kind of grow with this offense as the year goes on, uh, not to say that this would be a waste of year or anything, but you would feel outstanding about where you are heading into, into 2023. Uh, I, I think if it goes beyond the first scrimmage, or uh, a couple of days beyond the first scrimmage, into that second scrimmage, I think that bodes really well for Hudson Card. I mean, everything I've heard, all signs of 20 to 20 years being the guy, mm -hmm. but I think the longer this goes on, the better it is for Hudson Card. At least I think that should be the perception because that'll mean he's playing his way into the job. So this is, this is Mike Craven here. So does that mean for you that you think this is kind of like Quinn Ewer's job to take? And if, if Hudson kind of emerges as the guy, that means just Quinn didn't kind of get to the level as fans or as, you know, guys who watched him as high school, you know, prospect thinks that he would get to. I think so, Mike. I think it's more of how much of the offense can Quinn digest. And I, the biggest thing I think that he has to get over uh, I, I don't think it's anything about pure talent, uh, but one of, you know, like a lot of coaches, and I think this is really what made the decision last year to not go with Casey Thompson and go with Hudson Card. And one thing Sark really does not like as a quarterback to turn the football over, and that's careless with the football. Uh, and I think there were times he saw it a little bit in the spring game, but we heard, we heard about it from the close scrimmages. Uh, you know, a guy trusting his arm. I mean, you got to remember, I mean, Quentin Ewers hasn't thrown a pass in a game situation you want to count whatever scrimmages he got in Ohio State, but you're going back to his senior year at Southlake. So he, he didn't throw a pass last year in a game at Ohio State. So, I mean, spring ball, was that was the first time he had really been, like, anything close to legitimate live reps. And I, I think trusting his arm a little bit more and you don't anticipate speed and how quick the windows close and things like that. But that, to me, Mike, that's the big question with Quinn and Sark is, you know, Sark last year, he just kind of went with Hudson Carter. I think probably was maybe a little bit of a safer choice because uh, he didn't like some of the turnovers Casey had in, in the scrimmages. Does Sark have, for lack of a better term, the stomach to put up with some of the turnovers, knowing that with the guy as talented as Quinn is, that the upside's going to be there? You know, you kind of mentioned the offensive line a, a little bit here. You know, some really good players coming in, but it, that's always felt like a position where coaches are like, man, we can't expect an 18-year-old to come in from high school and, and play right away. You know, if we if we go to, like, midseason, right, like how many of those true freshmen do you think are legitimately in the rotation or maybe even in the starting lineup by then? I think up to three or four. I mean, Cole Hudson got a jump on everybody because he was in town for spring practice. You know, Sark even said he's working a little bit of center. I mean, that's another thing with this Texas offensive line. I mean, if you want to start talking about the most valuable pieces, Mike, on this Texas team, Jake Majors is pretty high up there because I don't know what they would do for a backup center, knock on wood, if something happened to Jake Majors. I know Cole Hudson's working there. Uh, Kelvin Banks is going to play. Uh, De Devon Campbell's going to play somewhere. And I know he's another guy that Sark and Kyle Flood both said has kind of started to work some center a little bit, just training him there to see if – maybe in, a, in an emergency spot he could be a center or maybe down the line somewhere. Uh, I know the staff is also really excited about Cameron Williams. I mean, they love big people. They, you know, there's no, there's no right. There's no wrong way to build a good offensive line. Uh, and that's kind of the way Sark wants to do it. You know, you, I asked him about this actually at coaching school. Cause I don't think we've ever really asked him about like, why do you want these big, massive human beings? Whereas I think the previous staff at Texas, they kind of wanted to get more smaller guys and, and see if you can build them up. And, the Sark talked about his time in the NFL when he was the OC in Atlanta, and, and I went back and verified it. He was right. The Falcons had the lightest offensive line in the league the two years he was there, and he said he just really 
got frustrated when they would go play, you know, the Ravens or the Steelers or teams with these big defensive fronts, the Eagles, and and they would kind of get their head handed to him. And he, he said he told himself, look, if I ever get a chance to do this again on my own, I'm not going to walk into a stadium and get bullied. And he feels like to do that, you need big people. And I think Cam Williams out of Duncanville is, is that kind of guy. So I mean, I just named four right there, Mike. I think, and, and it wouldn't surprise me if uh, if all four of those guys, if a couple of those guys, you know, you typically in a Texas season, usually by the by the that week after the Oklahoma game is usually when if there are some some leaks in the boat, you get them plugged up. It wouldn't surprise me at all if by that point a couple of those guys are starting or at least playing. You know, pretty significant high leverage snaps. Yeah, I've heard Kyle Flood say before, like there's weight classes for a reason. You know, like big guys beat up little yeah. guys. So I, I totally get that. Before we transfer over the defensive side of the ball, like Texas is, has struggled over the last ten or so years, but they've always had really good running backs. Like you've been around this program a lot. You've covered them for a long time. Like where do you rank Bajon Robinson, or how do you classify Bajon Robinson in that upper echelon of running backs you've seen come through the forty? Oh, that's a good one. Um, you know, I, I said this, Mike, when he was coming out of high school. Uh, I thought the comp for him was I, – I fe- and, and, look, this is huge because I remember when this guy I'm going to mention was coming out of high school, and he was what I felt like was one of the best high school football players and still one of the best high school football players I've ever seen. I felt he was Cedric Benson, but with a little more juice. Like when you just – you know, Cedric Benson had some of the best feet for a running back and just natural running instincts – I've ever seen. And Bijan's got some of that, but then you throw in the fact that he probably, Xavier Worthy included, has the best hands on the team. Uh, and I think they're going to use him more in the passing game this year. All the tools he brings to the table, he's got the, the stop-start ability, the change-of-direction ability, and he does have the ability to, to thump you between the tackles because he can handle that kind of pounding. Uh, that would kind of be my, my comp, Mike. I mean, I know some people say there's the Jamal Charles thing. I don't know if People just automatically go there because of the the dreads or whatever. But uh, you know Jamal Charles, with all due respect to how how fast Bijan is, Jamal Charles was world class fast. But that's kind of how I've always thought of Bijan, and that's kind of how I see him. I, I think he's Cedric Benson with just a little more juice. You remember those toys as a kid that were like bigger at the bottom, so you tackle them and they'd pop right back up because you couldn't get them off balance. That's what I think about with Bijan Robbins. Like he has the best balance of any running back I've ever seen. I think at the college level. Yeah, the the balance of the, the footwork, Mike, is, is just what does it for me. I mean, you never really – this is – I know this gets said a lot about quarterbacks. Um, and I said this about Kyler Murray, you know, not to go too far off on a tangent, but people always say this, well, you know, Kyler, because of his size, he'll never hold up because of his size. I'm like, yeah, but, you know, if you watch Kyler Murray, even in Allen, even in his time in Oklahoma, like Kyler Murray never really got hit hard. Mm-hmm. And when you watch Bijan, like, to your point, he never really gets hit hard. And when he does – uh, it's really, really hard to get him on the ground. He's not a guy you're going to bring down with arm tackles. You're going to need to bring it, and there's going to have to be three, four, five hats on the ball to get him on the ground. But you never – you don't see his highlight reel or just watch game cut-ups and see where he just takes, at times, almost the unnecessary shots that some guys will take, almost like, hey, I've got to prove I'm tough. No, just be a smart runner. I think that's another underrated thing about him. I think b a really smart runner. You know, we talk a lot about the offense. Everybody wants to talk about the offense because it's kind of the, the fun, sexy position. But, you know, I, I heard Pete Kwiatkowski kind of make a joke of, like, what pass rush the other day at, at a at a press conference. Where does that come from? Like, are there some guys on the roster that maybe fans and, and, and people like me who don't cover it day in, day out, like, we just don't know that guy yet, but he's going to emerge. Like, how do they kind of figure that out personnel-wise? Can we keep just talking about the offense? It's <laughs> fun to talk about with Texas. No, I mean, you know, you look at the numbers last year, Mike. I mean, Texas last year, 1.67 sacks per game. Uh, that's the worst per game sack total for a Texas defense since 1997. Uh, and anytime time you're talking about that 97 defense, uh, in terms of a record set since then, it's not anything good. <laughs> uh, you know, Ben Davis was your sack leader at two and a half. That's the lowest total for a Texas single season sack leader since the school started recording them as an official statistic in 1975. And then, you know, not just the pass rush, Mike, but I, you know, I went back and looked at the numbers, kind of crunched some, some pro football focus data. You realize on runs to the C gap and out last year, Texas gave up almost seven yards of carry. So, <laughs> so on the edges, you couldn't affect the quarterback with any level of consistency. You couldn't stop the run with any level of consistency. And, you know, that's where, you know, missing on a guy like O'Shawn Mathis out of the transfer portal really hurts you. I, I think they're going to, you know, 
they're they're gonna have to do some things schematically to shore up the edges. You know, in terms of personnel, I think you kind of got to money ball it a little bit and just try some different guys there. You know, Demarvin over. I know they're they're this staff from everything we've heard, Mike. They really like Jalen Ford. I think he's going to be a really good player at inside linebacker, and he needs to be if they're going to move Demarvin over, showing around and use him on the edge as much as they want to try to get a little more pass rush. Uh, you know, Justice Finkley, Jamon Tapp, Baron Sorrell, those are some of the young guys that you'll see play this year. But you know, even the really good edge guys we've seen Texas churn out in the last 20 or so years, you know, Alex Oka for Jackson, Jeff Coat, Sam Ocho, those guys weren't playing, you know, 250, 300 snaps as true freshmen. They were kind of situational guys and good so I know depth at those various points has been very different than it is now. Uh, but, you know, you'll see those young guys play. How many how many snaps will they get? And do you trust them? Uh, I think, you know, you look at a guy like Alfred Collins. Uh, can you kick him out a little bit in some situations? And can he be a better run defender when he's out there? You know, a guy like Moro Ojimo can play multiple shades. So I just think they're going to have to take what they've got. There's no – I say all that to say this, but there's no easy answer on how to fix Texas on the edges with stopping the run or getting out for the quarterback. They're just going to have to tweak some things schematically and take what they've got and figure out what are the best situations to use these guys, what's the, the right number of snaps for these guys. And quite frankly, I know Texas fans don't want to hear this, but I think at that point you just kind of have to hope that either something clicks for a guy like Alfred Collins or that these young cats I just mentioned, that they're just that good and they can handle a heavy workload. So we, we kind of mentioned those stats, right, the edge not being all that great. Anthony Hill commits to A&M. You know, a defensive end from Westlake right down the road commits to Oklahoma. Uh, how much of a, of a leash does Pete Kwiatkowski has, uh, have, especially with Gary Patterson kind of looming in the background? Is he there to help or is he there to take over? Yeah, he's here to help, but I, I think it was made pretty clear why he's here in the first place. You know, I don't think anybody – Anybody in that coaching office, anybody with a dog in the fight, so to say, was happy with how things went on defense. I, I don't think that this is a situation like Texas got into in 2013 where, you know, Matt thought, going back to that year, you know, Matt thought long and hard after the 2012 season about firing Manny Diaz and kind of, I think everybody knew, kind of brought in Greg Robinson as a, break glass in case of emergency situation. I don't think it's that for a couple of reasons. I think one, I think Steve, Sar- Steve Sarkeesian is going to give Pete Kwiatkowski the benefit of the doubt to try to fix it. I, I think in terms of understanding the personnel, the, the personnel adapting to the coaches and vice versa, I think there really is a sense that everybody is more on the same page this year than maybe they were last year. And by the way, too, you got to remember, Pete Kwiatkowski was hired after this defensive staff was already put together. So you're talking about this unique ecosystem of players trying to get to know coaches, coaches trying to get to know players. I mean, you had your D.C. You know, last spring trying to get to know his assistant coaches and, 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 un, and understand the personalities and the idiosyncrasies of guys he's working with. So I think it was just a work in progress last year defensively that never worked out. But I also think, too, like when you look at Gary Patterson, I just don't think like he had plenty of opportunities to go get uh, a power five DC job. If he wanted one, I just think this is kind of his way of staying close to the game, but yet taking a step back, pardon the pun from those responsibilities that he would have as a head coach. He doesn't have to recruit. You don't have to deal with, you know, boosters and donors and things like that. Uh, you know, you can just kind of be a film room junkie and, and get back to your roots as a coach of, um, helping you know develop and mold football players and, and being involved in the evaluation process, which I know he's been a part of. So I just don't think it's – I know Texas fans kind of want to look at that situation back in 2013 and think this is the same thing. I don't think this is the same thing, but trust me, uh, Pete Kwiatkowski should have gotten the message because I think it's pretty clear why Gary Patterson's here to, to make sure this defense isn't one of the worst in school history for the second year in a row. And then last one for me, I really appreciate the time. If I set the over and under at eight for this season, win total, uh, which one are you headed towards, the over or the under? I would slightly take the over. I mean, I think this is an eight-win team that has a chance to go get the nine wins for the bowl game. I think with the schedule, that would be a good year. I'll I'll tell you this, you know, I was looking at the road games Texas plays this year, like their true road games. I know Oklahoma's a neutral side game. But, you know, the road trips, like this could be the last time for a while, and who knows, maybe ever, that Texas goes out to Lubbock to play a football game. This could be the last year Texas goes to Stillwater, the last road trip to Manhattan. Those are going to be pretty – I would expect them – 
to be pretty charged up environments. And you've got a head coach in Steve Sarkeesian whose road record as a head coach is 13 and 31. So Sark in his career hasn't been great on the road in Texas last year. You know, some of their worst games, Arkansas and Iowa State jump out. They were not good at all on the road last season. So I think that road schedule, if you, you know, kind of, the, I've been trying to think about it, like, like the path to eight wins, uh, you know, you probably got to split those road games and then be at least one and two in that three game run of, you know, Alabama game two, the Oklahoma game, and then finishing off with Baylor. And then assuming you win your other games, that's your path to eight and four. I think with this schedule, with the issues they've got on defense and with having to replace, you know, pretty much every major fulcrum, so to say, of their special teams. You know, I mean, Cameron Dicker's gone. They've got to replace a four-year snapper with Justin Motter. And you're breaking in a new holder with Ryan Bischewski leaving. You know, you take all those things into consideration. You can't lean on special teams the way you did last year. I think an eight-win regular season with everything that I just talked about, with a chance to get to nine with a bowl game, I think that would be a really good year for this program, for this team, and kind of show that Sark has things, you know, trending in the right direction. All right, sir. We really appreciate the time. Uh, thank you for coming on, and, and enjoy those 15 minutes of uh, stretches that you get to watch there. <laughs> I'm, I'm all over it. I'm waiting in the parking lot with bated breath right now. <laughs> <laughs> Keep that AC on. We appreciate it, man. All right. Thanks, guys. Uh, there goes Jeff Howe with 247. You can follow him on Twitter, at Jeff Howe 247. Like I said, 1% of this, uh, he's part of the 1%. With the I Texas really Lakers. thought you were going to like lead him into a Lane Hatcher question. You know, <laughs> like, just like, yeah, thanks for coming on. Texas State. Over <laughs> right. under I know. Uh, <laughs> I do think his point about the schedule is is, an, uh, is a good one, one right? Like, I have not like, thought about that. Texas doesn't leave the state until October 22nd. Yeah, that's that's, that's wild to the me. O, the OU game's technically a road game this year that right. happens in Dallas, sure. and they're at Tech. Right. Right? They only leave the state three times all year. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that's, that's at Oklahoma crazy. State, October twenty second. At Kansas State, November fifth. At Kansas, big time, big time game there. Revenge, revenge tour, yeah. uh, November nineteenth. Right. <laughs> so like they only leave the state <laughs> three so times. Sad. I can't. Two believe of I'm them is to Kansas. I can't believe that's I'm looking so at Kansas' sad. schedule to see who they have before <laughs> to make sure it's not a let down. down <laughs> let down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They need to look at it, see it after, so they're not overlooking Texas. You know, like you know, oh, we got Oklahoma State next week. Oh, yeah, they right? got Kansas State the next week. Oh, that's Whoa. a big time. Yeah. That's a rivalry, rivalry that is game. Let down, look ahead. For yeah. <laughs> so it is. It is kind of this convergence of two different things, right? They're a brand new football team. Thirty-five right. of their eighty-five scholarship players are, are new, yep. right? Either transfers or incoming freshmen. We just heard Jeff say that he expects three to four <laughs> true freshman offensive linemen, and I think he's right. I'm just yeah. laughing because like that's insane, right? right? That that shows how bad you've been. Uh, at recruiting offensive line and developing offensive yeah. line leading into this. But with that schedule, right, because, you know, that OU game, home versus away, what does it really do, right? Is this what color of jersey you wear? And then who gets to host recruits, yep. right? But on the field, it's pretty much the same thing. The schedule lines up for this team to be really, really good. Mm -hmm. uh, they just have to go do it. And we saw last year they can play with anybody. Mm -hmm. They just couldn't do it for four quarters. Right. Are they deeper? Are they more talented? Do they believe in what they're doing a little bit more? I wouldn't be surprised if Texas won 10 games. I wouldn't be surprised if Texas won five games. Right. And that's just where we're at with the Longhorns. And until that changes, that's to me, you used to count. You, it, it, they were winning 10 games. Mm -hmm. sure. They were winning nine games. You, you know, like a bad that, season yeah. was nine wins, right? It's like, man, what's happened in Texas? You know? mm -hmm. And now it's like, man, I, don't, I have no idea. I have no clue how good or how bad this team will be because it's not about talent. If it was mm -hmm. about talent, they wouldn't be having this dip for the last 13, 12 years or whatever it is. They're going to be talented. They're going to be talented, more talented than 10 out of the 12 teams on their schedule. Mm -hmm. Oklahoma and Alabama are the only ones. They're, they're going to be more talented th than Baylor. Mm -hmm. But can they beat those teams? Mm -hmm. 